Good morning. I see so many people out this morning. I want to welcome our visitors. We're glad you've chosen to be with us this morning. Uh, welcome to all those tuning in on our live stream fa page on Facebook. I want to thank Brother Matt for the excellent song selection he just led us in singing with the theme of light. For this morning's title is Light Shall Shine Out of Darkness, taking it as our text from 2 Corinthians 4, 5 through 6. So you can be turning there if you'd like. We're going to be starting reading that particular passage, 2 Corinthians 4, 5 to 6, in a few minutes. As you're turning there, I want you to, we're going to be talking about what Paul says to the saints at Corinth. But as you're turning there, I want us to focus our minds just a little bit on the Thessalonian saints. And as you're turning to 2 Corinthians 4, I just want to recap some things from the first book and second book, or the first and second letters to the saints at Thessalonians. The Thessalonian saints were a great example of teaching the gospel to others everywhere they went. We're told in 1 Thessalonians 1, 6 to 8, that the gospel, the word of the Lord, sounded forth from the Thessalonian brethren. It says, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your faith toward God has gone forth. What a commendation. He says that they sounded forth the gospel to Macedonia and Achaia and everywhere they went. Wouldn't you love if an apostle wrote the courthouse church of Christ a letter and said, everywhere you go, you take the gospel with you and it's well known among the brotherhood. That, wouldn't that just be awesome? This must have been the be perfect beginning to the letter of encouragement for those brethren at Thessalonica. The saints, the saints at Thessalonica were also called through the gospel to have the glory of Christ. We're told in 2 Thessalonians 2, 13 to 14, that they were called through the gospel. And that gospel call still calls individuals today. The call of God has sounded forth, just as the Thessalonians sounded it forth long ago in 1 Thessalonians 1, 8. We're told in 2 Peter 1, 1 to 4, he called us by his own glory and excellence. 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 2 says, saints are called by God. And we're called out of darkness into the light of the sun, as Peter writes to his audience in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 9. You know, the world is full of evil and darkness. This past week, the news has been inundated with a tragedy out of Uvalde, Texas. And the families there that are devastated in a community that is entirely shaken and, and rocked to its core because of this tragedy. And in the wake of that, politicians politicize uh, talking heads in the news media place blame and want to point fingers, and you're going to hear all kinds of horrible things. You're going to hear things from different sides with all kinds of solutions. And the point is, what the dark and evil world around us needs to hear is the gospel. If we could change the hearts and minds of people, evil will slowly lose its grip. But as it is, we cannot legislate evil out of people because it's a heart problem. What the world around us needs to hear is the gospel. We need to sound it forth just as the Thessalonian saints were known for doing. Colossians 3 and verse 16 tells us that when, one of the things we do when we come together is we sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. And we do those things, we sing them to one another because they teach and they admonish. Knowing that, I want us to focus our thoughts today on the lyrics to the hymn, Send the Light. And Matt has graciously agreed to lead that as our invitation hymn, song number 786 in our hymn book. But Send the Light was written in 1890 by Charles H. Gabriel, who lived from 19, or I'm sorry, 1856 to 1932. And we're going to focus this morning's thoughts around the, those three stanzas that we're about to sing from Send the Light. And one of the things I thought about as I was putting this together was 2 Corinthians 4, 5 to 6, the passage I told you was our base text and that we would be reading here soon. Paul, writing through the Spirit, says, For we do not preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus as Lord, and ourselves as your bondservants for Jesus' sake. For God, who said, Light shall shine out of darkness, is the one who is shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. He says, we don't preach ourselves, we preach Christ. He says, God said, light shall shine out of darkness, and it is the one that shone that light in our hearts 
so that we might give that light to others, so that they might know the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. The darkness of the world around us needs to hear the gospel. The hymn that we're about to sing reminds us of, we need to send the light. Who among us will send the light? One of the things we see when we first open up our hymn book to 786 is stanza one. And stanza one says, there's a call comes ringing or the restless wave. Send the light, send the light. There are souls to rescue, there are souls to save. Send the light, send the light. One of the first things it tells us that we must do to recognize sending the light is there are souls to save. The call that comes ringing is through the gospel. 2 Thessalonians 2 and verse 14, as I referenced earlier, that it's that gospel call to obey that calls to men's hearts and calls us to come out of the darkness into the light. Jesus said he came to seek and save the lost, Luke 19.10. I often refer to that as Jesus' mission statement. He said, I've come to save, the, or to save the lost. I've come to seek and save the lost. He said it about going into Zacchaeus' house. There is this tax collector that climbed a sycamore tree just to see Jesus and got way more than he bargained for. Because Jesus came under that tree, looked him in the eye and said, Zacchaeus, come down from there for I'm coming to your house today. And Zacchaeus jumped down and, and apologized and repented for any sins that he had committed. And as all of the crowd began mumbling and complaining that Jesus was going to go into this tax collector's home, Jesus says, I have come for this very reason, to seek and to save the lost. We're told there in 2 Corinthians 4, 5 to 6, one of the reasons when we become Christians, one of our missions is that light in our heart. We can't keep it there. We're to shine forth that light so that others might know the knowledge of Christ. Saints need to shine that light of the gospel into the dark world around us. Remember that light and dark, light not only illuminates, but it exposes what is in the dark. And the light needs to illuminate the evil and call it for what it is and call the evil to repent. This call reminds us that souls need to be rescued because they are precious. Matthew 16, 26, one soul is that person's most precious possession. And Jesus says there are those who will forfeit their soul for the choices they make in this life. The only thing that we will take with us out of this world or out of this life is our soul and its deeds. And because these precious souls have sinned, they need to be saved. Romans 3.23 reminds us that all men have sinned. Romans 6.23 says the wages for that sin is death, but... The free gift of eternal life is only found in Christ Jesus. So there are souls to save. So saints need to be ready to send the light. And as we sing this hymn, as we sing it with our heart and with our mind, pay attention to the lyrics because we're saying we're going to do this. We also see as we start singing stanza two that there is a help of the gospel. He reminds us of what happens in Acts chapter 16. We say, it says, we have heard the Macedonian call today. Send the light, send the light. And a golden offering at the cross we lay. Send the light, send the light. Just as Paul received a call from a man of Macedonia in a vision, saying, come over and help us, the gospel calls all Christians to shine that light out of darkness. Again, 2 Corinthians 4, 5 to 6, tells us that that light in our heart is there to shine forth to let others know the knowledge of Jesus Christ. In Acts 16 and verse 9, a man from Macedonia appeared to Paul in a vision saying, come over to Macedonia and help us. Paul didn't start getting together a food drive and a clothing drive and all kinds of other things to, to help in physical ways. No, in verse 10, it says Paul and all those with him understood that this plea for help meant that they need to go and preach the gospel to those in Macedonia. And the first to hear that were those in Philippi were Lydia, and then later the jailer, as we talked about this morning, were some of the early converts there at the church in Philippi. Lydia and her household in Acts 16, 11 through 15, were baptized. The jailer, later on in Acts chapter 16, were baptized. While we should go where we can, no individual, no one individual can go everywhere. 
but all of us can give a golden offering, as the song reminds us of, so that those who can go to other places can be supported. We see in Philippians 4, 15 to 16, Paul tells the Philippian saints that when he went to Thessalonia, when he went on all these missionary field trips, that they alone were the ones who provided help and support for him. They sent financial aid while they themselves didn't go into to Thessalonia. Paul went to Thessalonia and they helped him, supported him to do that. And in that sense, they gave him that golden offering to allow him to do it. 2 Corinthians 9, 6 to 7, Paul is reminding the Corinthian saints, while they didn't physically go into Judea to relieve the needy saints, their gift of support and love to Paul and Barnabas on their way to Judea was their gift of love and that golden offering to help in that work. But the gospel is the best help for a dark and evil world. Jesus draws the, the distinction between light and dark in John 3, 19 to 21. He says, darkness hates the light because it does not want its deeds exposed. But those of the light have no fear of the light because their works are manifest in God. The gospel is God's power to save, Romans 1, 16. And in the gospel, we learn of man's sin and we learn of the cure, which is the blood of Jesus Christ. Romans 3.23 and John 3.16. In fact, the gospel, part of teaching the gospel is to teach Jesus Christ. We learn of him and how he came to this earth. He lived, as we can read there in, Mark, in Matthew 1 and Luke 2, the birth account of Jesus. He lived as a human being, the creator in the form of the created. He lived and taught the truth, Matthew 5 to 7. We can see how the, at the end of his Sermon on the Mount, the people responded saying, he teaches as one having authority, not as one like the scribes and the Pharisees. He taught the truth, and then he died upon the cross, and he shed his blood for the forgiveness of sins, as he states in Matthew 20, verse 28. Matthew 26, verse 28, we can read in Ephesians 1, 7, and 1 Corinthians 15, 3 through 4. This is the gospel. He came, he lived, he died, he was buried. But death was not his master. He rose again. And hearing and believing in Christ and being baptized for the forgiveness of those sins, Mark 16, 16 and Acts 2, 38, is the beginning of a new life and walk with God. Because we learn of his victory over death at his resurrection. We read of his ascension where he now sits at the right hand of God as we see in Luke 24, 1 to 9, Acts 1, 9 to 11, and 1 Corinthians 15, 1 to 8. And hearing and believing that Jesus Christ is our Lord and Savior, <clears throat> that he died shedding his blood for you and for me, that our sins would be washed away. We too can have that forgiveness of sins. And it's the beginning of that new life and walk with God that Paul mentions in Romans 6, 3 through 8. And when people hear when they believe and obey that plan of salvation, as C.J. pointed out in his prayer from the beginning of the world, from its foundation, this plan was put in place. This is when they're truly helped. When that soul that receives the light comes into the light and receives that light into their heart, and then they go forth and let it shine that they might bring others to Christ as well. James 1.21, John 12.48 and 2 Thessalonians 1, 7-9. True help comes by introducing sinful man to Christ and showing them the Lord's plan to bring them out of darkness into the light that they might have salvation. As saints, as Christians by calling, we are to send the light into the dark world. But it's easy to grow weary, isn't it? As we sing this hymn, it's going to remind us in the third stanza not to grow weary. Stanza three says, let us not grow weary in the work of love. Send the light, send the light. Let us gather jewels for a crown above. Send the light, send the light. In the work of sending the light, we must not grow weary. Galatians 6, 9 to 10, 2 Timothy 2, 24 to 26 tells us that we have, this is a great work and that we are to do it and not grow weary. But it's easy to become weary. You know, Jesus spoke in parables. So I want us to consider a modern day parable on how the church can grow weary. How the church can become complacent and fail in her mission to send the light. I want to read 
a parable called the Parable of the Life-Saving Station. It's by an author unknown. But it's the Parable of the Life-Saving Station, and you might have heard it before. It says, On a dangerous seacoast where shipwrecks often occur, there was once a crude little life-saving station. The building was just a hut, and there was only one boat. But the few devoted members kept a constant watch over the sea, and with no thought for themselves, they went out day or night tirelessly searching for the lost. Many lives were saved by this wonderful little station, so it became famous. Some of those who were saved and various others in surrounding areas wanted to become associated with the station and give of their time, of their money, and effort for the support of its work. New boats were bought, new crews were trained, and this little life-saving station grew. Some of the new members of the life-saving station were unhappy that the building was so crude and so poorly equipped. They felt a more comfortable place should be provided as the first refuge of those saved from the sea. So they replaced the emergency cots with beds. They put better furniture in an enlarged building. Now the life-saving station became a popular gathering place for its members. They redecorated it beautifully and furnished it as sort of a club. Fewer of the members were now interested in going on sea or going out to sea on life-saving missions, so they hired lifeboat crews to do this work. The mission of life-saving was still given lip service, but most were too busy or lacked the necessary commitment to take part in life-saving activities personally. About this time, a large ship was wrecked off the coast. The hired crews brought in boatloads of cold, wet, half-drowned people. The victims were dirty and sick and made a mess in the beautiful new clubhouse. The property committee immediately had a shower house built outside the club where victims of shipwreck could be cleaned up before coming inside. At the next meeting, there was a split in the membership. Most of the members wanted to stop the club's life-saving activities on account of it being unpleasant and a hindrance to the normal life pattern of the club. But some members insisted that life-saving was their primary purpose and pointed out that they were still called a life-saving station. They were finally voted down and told if they wanted to save the life of all the various kinds of people who were shipwrecked, they could begin their own life-saving station. So they did. As the years went by, the new station experienced the same changes that occurred in the old. They evolved into a club, and yet another life-saving life -saving station was founded. If you visit the seacoast today, you'll find a number of exclusive clubs along that shore. Shipwrecks are still frequent in the waters, only now most of the people drown. The parable is a sad reminder of what happens to the church. We're called to be a life-saving station, a soul-saving station. But it's easy to become complacent, to think of ourselves as an exclusive group, and we don't want really those dirty outsiders to come in forgetting that we were once dirty outsiders too and needing a place to come to be with God's people who are also the redeemed. Some people say they're not gifted at teaching or preaching, so the work of saving the lost is left for someone else more capable. But I want to give you four simple things that every single saint can do. Four things that every single saint can do. One, you can shine. Remember 2 Corinthians 4, 5 to 6, as you read earlier? That light in our hearts isn't there just to give us a warm, fuzzy feeling. It's there so we can shine that light out so that others might know the knowledge of Christ. So we can shine. Matthew 5, 16 says, Let your light so shine before men that others see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. We can live by example. That's what Ephesians 4, 1 to 3 says. There's an old saying, I can't take credit for it, but an old saying that says, <clears throat> your life may be all the sermon a person gets. Make it a good one. You can live by example. By letting your light shine, by living as an example of people in your circle of friends, your co-workers, people at school, the people who interact with you daily, they can see the light in your heart. What do they see on a daily basis? Do they see that light shine? You can speak. Ephesians 4.15 says, Speak the truth in love. As saints, Christ should be in our conversations. We ought to talk about how He rescued us from the dark. What our life used to be. What it was. What it might be without Him. 
We ought to tell our friends, our neighbors, our family. We ought to speak about the things that are important already on a daily basis to those we love, to those we come in contact with. We talk about things that are important to us. Do others hear you speak of Jesus? Would they know that about you in your conversation? That somewhere you're going to talk about Jesus? To let that light shine? And third, you can invite. In John 1, 45 to 46, Philip came to Nathanael, his friend, and told him, we found the Messiah. This Jesus of Nazareth is the one the prophet spoke of. And Nathanael said, can anything good come out of Nazareth? And Philip just simply said, come and see. Come and see. You can invite. So what I often do in the summertime is this is going to be the summertime. It's coming up. Memorial Day weekend kicks off the summer generally. We're going to have a lot more visitors among us generally. We're going to go places. We're going to travel. We're going to go see things. We're going to be in contact with other people. This is a great time. And, I, and as I often do in the summertime is challenge you to invite at least two people using the, the cards we have in the back, the invitation cards. This time I've had the kids pass out two cards because my challenge lots of times, I just tell you to pick up a card. This time I want to make sure they're in your hands. So today you have two cards. And my challenge is meet and greet two people just in this next month or over the summer and hand them a church invitation card. You now have two in your possession, and if you don't, if you sat down having not gotten one, see Drayson or one of the kids afterwards, they'll make sure you get two in your hand. This is something we can all do. It's, it's, this is one of the simplest things we can do, is talking with somebody, hand them that card, and just invite them to services. Invite them to come. Even tell them, use Philip's words, come and see. Come and see what it's like being with God's people and invite them. This is something that every person can do. Sometimes, and I, I'm sad to say I, I don't have it as, I can't say I'm 100%, but oftentimes at a restaurant when I leave a tip, I'll, if I think about it, I'll leave a card with them, with that tip, so that they know where to find me. <laughs> and welcome. James chapter 2, 1 to 4, James tells saints how to welcome and how not to welcome people into our assemblies. The assembly of God's people ought to be a place that is warm and welcoming, very inviting, because we're to love everybody and invite them to come in. Because we're not, we're not any different than they are. The difference is we've invited, we've invited that light into our heart. We've been obedient to the gospel. We were baptized, having our sins washed away, and we want that for them. We want those that come into our midst to have that same salvation, to wash their sins away, to have that light reside in their heart so that they too can shine it forth. We want the assembly of God's people to be a warm and welcoming place. These are four things that every saint can do. You can live by example, letting your light shine. You can speak the truth in love. You can invite and you can be welcoming to those who you come in contact with and welcoming especially those who come into our assembly. These are ways that we don't grow weary because we need to recognize God wants all men to be saved. 1 Timothy 2, 3-4, 2 Peter 3, 9. And we won't grow weary if we, if we remember that we're gathering up God's jewels for him. That's what the hymn reminds us of. We're gathering up those jewels. It'll help us to persevere to recall that those jewels which we gather are our joy and crown. That's what Paul said in Philippians 4.1. Speaking to the church there in Philippi, of, of which would be Lydia and the jailer, Paul says they were his joy and his crown. Matthew 6, 19-21. Jesus tells us this world is not our home. Paul reminds the Philippian saints of that. Oh, they might have been able to boast that they had Roman citizenship, but he says in Philippians 3.20, your citizenship is in heaven, and we long to be there. This world is not our home, so we must not grow weary or become content with the treasures of the world. But Jesus says, seek the treasures of heaven. Hebrews 12.1-3 says, we run the race with endurance, casting aside those things that easily entangle. 
Colossians 3, 1 to 3 says, don't look down on, on what is below, but focus our eyes on above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. So let us not grow weary and lose heart, but let us continue to send the light. The chorus of this hymn urges us onward to let the light of the glorious gospel of Christ to shine everywhere. The chorus we're about to sing says, Send the light, the blessed gospel light. Let it shine from shore to shore. Send the light, the blessed gospel light. Let it shine forevermore. I happen to love this hymn. And as I contemplated the words of this, I could not help but think of 2 Corinthians 4, 5 to 6, that says we have that light of Christ in our hearts, and we're not to hold it in. We're not to be selfish with that. We are to shine that forth so that others might have that knowledge of Jesus Christ, that they too might have that light in their hearts and want to save their family and friends. And I have to ask us this morning, what kind of life-saving station are we? What have we become? An exclusive club that doesn't want any outsiders in? One that's just basking in our own material blessing? Or are we one that's faithfully fulfilling its mission? Never losing sight that our mission is to seek and save the lost, as Jesus said, and to bring them in and make them part of the family. That is our mission. And may God's grace and mercy that was shown toward us compel us forward to make us active in sharing that same grace and mercy to others. And we can do this by sounding forth the gospel call to obey and proclaim the praises of God. The darkness and evil of this world cannot be legislated out because it is a heart problem. And the solution, the absolute solution, is the gospel. Again, it comes back to Jesus Christ. He is the cure. His blood was shed so that mankind might be forgiven of all manner of sin. The gospel can change hearts. The gospel can transform lives. I encourage you to read 1 Corinthians 6, 9 to 11. And in verses 9 to 10, see the kind of people that made up the Corinthian church at one time. Look at what their past lives looked like. But then Paul says, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified. They no longer live that way, in a way that would co cost them their souls in hell. Paul says they turned. Brethren, we can teach that same gospel. Because just as it would turn the Corinthian saints from those horrendous lifestyles that are still rampant today, the gospel can still turn mankind from the darkness of sin to the light of the glorious sun. The gospel can change hearts and transform lives. We must but send the light. And if you're not a Christian this morning, you need to become one. To repent and be baptized today that you might have that light of Christ in you and let it shine forth to save your friends and family. And if you are a Christian, the question is, what kind of life-saving station member have you become? And are you ready for Judgment Day? And if not, you need to be ready. You need to repent and be ready for that day because the judgment starts with the household of God. And if you are in need of the invitation of any possible way, the waters of baptism, the prayers of the congregation on your behalf, you have but to come forward, let it be known while we stand and while we sing, send the light.